So I'm starting now. Transmission is going, uh, okay. We are online now. It should be. Yes. Okay. So I'm starting now. Okay. We are broadcasting live. Hey, uh, so, okay. Uh, welcome to everybody. This is Adriano Utino, the founder and vice president of the Space Renaissance International. Uh, we are very happy today to host uh, uh, this, uh, um, this broadcast from the Euromong Mars community and Space Renaissance together. Uh, in order to comment the launch of the James Webb uh, telescope that should be done today, but it was postponed one more day and it will uh, happen tomorrow at uh, this time, more or less. Uh, so uh, we will be very happy to see you tomorrow, but things everybody will be having lunch with <laughs> families. Uh, we maintained this, uh, uh, this date today in order to comment this very important uh, uh, event, the launch of the new web, uh, the new uh, telescope that will orbit uh, in, a, in, a, in a sun orbit at the Lagrange point uh, between Earth and the sun. So it will be about 1 million kilometers. Uh, okay, other commenters will say uh, better than me, uh, uh, as astronomical uh, things about uh, this uh, this uh, uh, telescope. So um, by uh, by the side of space renaissance, uh, very welcome everybody to this uh, uh, this conversation. Okay. Thank you, Adriano. Adriano. Yes. So uh, I am Bernard Frank. So I am the uh, president of the Space Renaissance International, but also I am the Okay, the, the director of uh, Young Moon Mars Earth Space Innovation. And it's a nice uh, collaborative project between uh, our two uh, uh, initiatives. And so today we are going to celebrate an event that we have been waiting for a long time, the uh, James Webb Space Telescope before it was called Next Generation Space Telescope when I uh, worked uh, at ESA uh, in the 90s. And uh, so we have put together a special program so we will have uh, our moderator, uh, Serena, uh, an anchor. She's also an analog astronaut. Uh, we have also with us uh, another analog astronaut uh, and astrophysicist, uh, Leanda. We have an astrobiologist, uh, Anouk. And we have also our uh, chief space uh, technical expert, uh, Rock Kettle. So now, uh, on behalf of uh, Space Renaissance International and the Moon Mars, uh, give the floor to our moderator and also uh, your Moon Mars Communication Officer, Serena Croti. Thank you, Bernard. Hello, everybody. Welcome to this virtual event. So, um, first of all, I will tell you a bit more about our guest speakers. So, as Professor Juan was already telling us before, we have with us Anouk Reiser. She is uh, here, she is. And we have also with us Leander Schlarman. So, uh, Anouk is a, a Master's of Physics at University Heidelberg. Sorry for my pronunciation. I'm, as you can see, I'm Italian. <laughs> so just be patient. And then we have also Leander. Instead, uh, he will give us a point of view from astronomy because he is a Master of Astronomy student at University of Vienna. And then we also have with, with us Rock Kitty. He will give us some insights from the technology part because he's an aerospace engineer student. And he will be happy to answer some uh, questions that could be uh, placed in the chat uh, about the technology of the telescope. And so let's say more technical questions. So the program of the day is uh, uh, this one. We will have first an overview and a big introduction about, uh, that will be given by Professor, Professor Fong. Then we will have two um, talks by Anouk and Leander, and then we will be happy to answer technical questions uh, from uh, Rock uh, Kitty's site. So I would start uh, with the Bernard Juan presentation. Excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Serena. And so, uh, yes, uh, cut to the chase, because in fact, if the launch uh, would have been uh, today, we would have had uh, to uh, count down already now uh, the launch is uh, planned in uh, some uh, 
14 minutes or so, and so at uh, 1320 uh, uh, CET. And uh, so um, uh, from the um, uh, ESA uh, friends that are involved in James Webb Space Telescope, I got uh, some uh, visual for you. And uh, we know that we have a broad public, Space Renaissance, Moon Mars, even family public. So we have put also some nice cartoons for you to describe Webb in a nutshell. So uh, James Webb Space Telescope, um, uh, in particular, it's built uh, by uh, NASA uh, overall uh, for a budget of $10 billion. Uh, dollars, but there is a very significant and critical contribution from Europe, from European Space Agency that is contributing to our web's uh, uh, science instruments, so near specs, the uh, infrared spectrometer, and also half of the MIRI um, uh, uh, image. So we have also some very good friends of astronomers that are and engineers that are supporting science operation. We will launch it on the European rocket Ariane 5 from European spaceport in French Guiana. And uh, so we will, uh, thanks to a web, we will probe uh, the, in uh, the dark ages of time. Uh, we, it will be the largest telescope ever launched. Uh, the previous one was a Herschel telescope from ESA, 3.5 meter diameter. This one is six meter. And uh, so web will look in the infrared at uh, very far in the in the past of our universe to look at the first stars, also the first galaxies after the dark ages. And also it will have the ability to uh, study uh, our solar system and exoplanets. So big question we want to address with uh, James Webb is how did the early universe look like? You know, the, we think that there was a big bang and, uh, and after three minutes, uh, there was production of some of the atoms uh, and then um, there was some recombination of some uh, uh, proton and electron that gave a huge flash, flash of light 100,000 years after Big Bang. And then the universe went into a dark age where nothing was emitted, but there was some matter that formed the first stars and then the first galaxies. And uh, uh, we want to have some signal from the time when, uh, just uh, after these dark ages, uh, to have some uh, uh, signal from these first galaxies first uh, star. Also, there were already some uh, violent processes there, black holes that form and evolve also in interaction with the galaxies. Then the uh, galaxies like ours were formed and we have, are going to study also the life cycle of stars, birth, evolution, growth, and death, and re, um, uh, recycling of the material from the, from the stars into the interstellar medium, you know, the, the stuff where we are made from. So hydrogen comes from the Big Bang, but uh, all the elements uh, like um, helium, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, okay, helium we don't have, but uh, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, uh, phosphor as, uh, comes from the uh, nuclear reaction inside stars. But also with um, the uh, GWST, we will have the ability to study all the planetary systems. You know, we have detected more than 5,000 other so uh, stellar systems in our galaxies, and we are going to study them more in detail, even to probe some of the composition of the planet that around that. So Leander is going to talk about that. We'll have the ability to study both planetary systems, but also the atmosphere of exoplanets. So uh, Webb and Ion 5, uh, Webb is gigantic, and it will not fit in the fairing of the Ion 5, which is a great rocket. So it had to be folded to fit into this uh, fairing, which is 17 meters in height, five meters in uh, diameter. And, uh, so the, and so that will be quite a critical moment to unfold the mirror itself and to put it with the uh, accuracy uh, that uh, it, it needs to operate. So they, it, there are a number of actuators on this uh, multi uh, mirrors that make uh, the web, but our technical expert will give uh, us more detail. But in addition, we want to protect the telescope that works into the infrared from um, the thermal and also the visible radiation from the sun, from the earth. And for this reason, it's put in this Lagrangian point away from this earth, 1.5 million kilometers from us. And we have uh, some layers of sun shield. So five uh, sun shield layers that will really isolate from uh, thermal, uh, uh, 
impact on the telescope. And so that will be, uh, so it will be uh, sent and deep, different elements will be deployed and we, we talk about this deployment sequence. So where are we? Uh, we are today launch minus uh, one day. And so the, so the ion five uh, uh, is rolling out on the launch uh, pad. But before, so uh, 55 days ago, the James Webb arrived at the harbor and uh, the main stage of the rocket was positioned on the launch uh, table. James Webb was placed on the Ion 5, put in the fairing, and now is waiting. And then uh, we will uh, talk about the sequence. So launch, and uh, actually we, uh, we would be almost like five minutes to launch now in a countdown, it will be happening today. And there will be a first uh, booster separation from uh, the first stage of the rocket, then fairing separation, and then main stage separation. And after um, 27 minutes, the spacecraft separation, then the, the spacecraft, uh, GWC spacecraft, uh, would be uh, <coughs> on its own. And then we have the ability to track it and then ensure that everything's fine, like a, a, a newly born baby. You know, we are checking all the signals uh, of life from our baby. So uh, we have a number of uh, science instruments on board. So I mentioned the one which uh, are contributed by the European Space Agency, ESA. Uh, so that's a near infrared spectrograph. So that's in full the responsibility of ESA that will look at uh, the composition and the temperature and mass of uh, a cosmic object. And it can measure the spectra of 200 objects at the same time. And it has a technique where it can even make uh, uh, maps spectral maps of those objects. So very powerful instrument, uh, quite complex. Then we have a um, 50% uh, is a contribution to the middle infrared instrument, the MIRI, that is cooled at very low temperature, so 10 Kelvin, so minus 266 uh, degree ref refrigerator, and also apply a technique of spectroscopy mapping uh, for objects in the middle infrared. Now, NASA is uh, building the near infrared camera so that only for imaging, so not uh, spectroscopy, but uh, it will have the ability to have the higher sensitivity to detect the first uh, object, first stars and galaxies from uh, the history of uh, our universe. And then we have uh, also uh, the ability to, uh, with a um, near infrared imager and slitless uh, spectrograph that is contributed by the Canadian Space Agency to uh, measure uh, the spectra of objects, uh, but in particular, we'll have the ability to measure uh, exoplanet transit and, uh, and uh, de derive some composition from the atmosphere from that. And it helps also in very high precision pointing of the uh, GWST. So we'll uh, hear more about some of the science that we do uh, from our guest. And the unfolding uh, sequence in a brief. Uh, so we launch, we deploy two structures that uh, protect the sun shields, very uh, delicate uh, uh, layers, and then we deploy laterally the sun shield, and then we, we <laughs> pull it uh, with enough uh, tension, separation, uh, so that the uh, five layers don't touch each other and uh, well, are well uh, insulated. And then uh, later we unfold the secondary mirror structure, and then also uh, deploy the lateral wings of the primary mirror. So as you know, the mirror is uh, coated with gold. Gold has a property to reflect very well in the infrared. And so, yes, it's a beautiful uh, uh, gold uh, jewels that we sent in space, much bigger than what I can afford. Uh, but uh, yes, it's uh, just a coating. You know, some um, underground from gold makes it a, a very beautiful uh, surface for infrared astronomy. So uh, just uh, we are uh, in Europe. And of course, uh, it's quite amazing that this big uh, flagship, uh, the next generation Hubble uh, telescope is launched with the European rocket, the Ariane 5. And this we have used already. So myself, I was uh, uh, the leader of a smart one and we launched even uh, my little moon mission with, uh, with uh, Ariane 5 as a third passenger. But uh, uh, for astronomy, we have launched XMM-Newton in 1999 with Ariane 5. We have launched also Rosetta to a comet. We have launched two spacecraft together, the Herschel and the Planck in 2009, uh, on a shared launch of Ariane 5. We launched Baby Colombo, and now we launch this uh, world uh, uh, telescope with a 
very strong contribution from the other force. So uh, this is for our friend from Ariane Espace that are working also now on the next generation Ariane 6. So, and uh, uh, clearly that's a lot about European partners going into uh, uh, space. So you see a number of uh, uh, industries and also research centers from all over Europe that have contributed uh, uh, to the development of uh, NIRSPEC, MIRI, but also the Ariane 5 uh, rocket. And all member states actually contribute through the ESA mandatory science program that they contribute as a, a fraction of their growth social program. So that's Europe going to Spain. So thank you very much. And the floor is back to you, Sylvia. Thank you very much for this very interesting presentation. So I invite our uh, audience to put uh, questions in the comments so that we can collect them and maybe read them at the end of our guest uh, uh, presentations or if there are any, uh, we can also see them now. Uh, so I would uh, give floor to Anouk. Uh, so Anouk, the floor is yours. You can share your screen. Hello everyone. So I'm going to talk about the deployment sequence and I have a video that I will comment. Um, so um, I'm going to talk you through what actually is going to happen in the next days um, and weeks actually following launch, like what is happening going to happen in the first few minutes and then later. So the credits are from Northrop Grumman, one of the supplier companies, and of course also from NASA. So um, right now, um, this is basically like a um, presentation of the launch pad in Kourou, French Guiana. The launch is done by an Ariane 5. It's a very reliable launch vessel that has like many experience. And you can see like on top, there's a specific thing. So when the, um, when the launch sequence starts, we first fire up the main, the core stage. And later on, the two things on the side are actually the solid rocket boosters, which will only ignite later, like right now, just like shortly after liftoff. The good thing is we are starting from the equator, so this gives us a little like additional kind of like an additional velocity because the Earth spins faster there. So we have like a little kind of like boost that we also get additionally. Um, and then after some time, we, in the first three minutes, we will 80% of our thrust will come from the solid rocket boosters. And then after some point, we will have the, um, the separation of the solid rocket boosters. And then it will be um, only launched by the, by the main, the core stage. Um, James Webb is in the upper part of this. You can also see the little logo. This is like where it is. It's, um, it's protected from the effects of, uh, of um, the atmosphere by like our, uh, by the fairing um, until we reach the upper atmosphere and then we'll open up. Now we have the solid rocket booster separation. They will fall down um, and should actually like um, over and enter over the Atlantic Ocean. And now it actually we have the, the, the main, the core stage. We now have the separation of the fairing. So now it's open exposed to space. Um, we don't need any kind of like um, any like um, protection against atmosphere anymore because there's very little atmosphere there. Now the main course, like the core stage shuts off. We have the secondary stage and the secondary stage is now going to like actually tilt, um, tilt um, it towards um, L2. Um, now we will have like before ignition, we will have a slit kind of like tilt down um, of James Webb before the secondary stage fires. Um, and that's also like to protect a little bit James Webb from the, from the sun because now of course it's exposed and we don't want it to heat up too much. The secondary stage will also make a series of complex oscillations that you can see there to always protect it from the sun to make sure that no part of the instruments is overheated too much. Um, and then actually, um, like bef just before, um, like when James Webb will separate from the secondary stage, this will be like actually like our last image that we have of the telescope. So now it will like it will uh, it will separate, and this will be about thirty minutes after launch. And there's actually a camera in the secondary stage. This will be the last time we will actually have like a direct camera view of James Webb. Um, now it's actually deploying its solar arrays, um, and it's going to like um, like fly itself by its own propellant. And now it's going to be on the way to L2. Um, and actually, this is like the propellant that it's using right now is very, very precious because there's no way to refuel it once it's reached L2. So this will also be the same propellant that is used to actually um, like align its, its, um, um, its um, collect position, depending on what it observes. This is like where it is going to, I'm going to go. Like L2 is basically a spot opposite of Earth from the sun. And it's going to like basically like orbit um, L2. There are many other deep space missions um, also in L2, like for example, Planck, Herschel, a lot of, lot of them, them that like um, very kind of like that do not want less interference from the sun. Um, and you can also see that actually L2 is directed away, like that the James Webb telescope is directed away from the sun because it's an infrared telescope. So you want as, as little as solar radiation as possible. 
Um, then after this reached L2, there will be a very, very complex um, sequence of deployment maneuvers, because as you can see, it is all furred up so that it can fit inside the Ariane 5 rocket, but it's much bigger actually than the Ariane 5 rocket. So to actually have like have it as, as this full tennis size court, it will look open up like a flower. Um, the pink sheeting that you see there is um, the outer part of actually this, like the solar heat shields. They're, they, they appear pink because they're actually coated with silicon. They're actually plastic sheets coated with silicon. Uh, and the other ones that you will see soon, um, the ones that are inside are actually, um, are actually covered with aluminum. All of these sheets are actually thinner than a human hair. So they're extremely, extremely delicate. Um, and the problem is, of course, you have like it's deep in space. So very often you also have micrometeorites. And if a micrometeorite were to hit these shields, it would basically just like tear all of it. So they actually put specific trims in there, specific bands to stop actually like a tear, if a tear happens, that it can still operate, that it's still, still shielded from the sun, um, even if it's hit by a micrometeorite. And now you can see it's kind of like a layering because the idea is that um, on one side, um, the um, James will, will be angled like this to so the sun, here will be the sun, here will be like the outermost pink shield. And that as much of solar radiation as possible, like almost all of it will be deflected away. And if some um, some infrared radiation makes it through, it will actually be deflected by the by the additional um, heat shields, and then will actually be this like a slight angle and will be deflected away from the telescope. Um, the inside of the mirrors that you can see are actually made of beryllium because it is much lighter than steel. And then we will have our beautiful infrared telescope um, able to peek into the darkest depth um, of the universe. And yeah, that's very exciting. And it will be fully deployed. Actually, it will be fully operational about a month afterwards. So um, that's very much looking forward to this, but it will be a very complex process and we hope that everything goes well. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anouk, for these inspiring videos. It really uh, seemed to be there <laughs> with uh, the web telescope. So it was very nice and interesting. There's um, a much to look forward to. <laughs> Yes, it put a lot of hype in what we will see tomorrow. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. The, the launch would have been exactly now. <laughs> it would have been okay. yeah. So I think it's good that we, we get these images in advance. Uh, that... We had a preview. <laughs> okay, so uh, I see we already have a question in the, in the um, live streaming. So somebody asked if, uh, um, a, a couple of questions actually. So. The first one is uh, if there, if it will be a manned mission, and then the second one is uh, uh, how about data access for the different instruments? So, okay, so let's uh, let's go because uh, indeed before we had the Hubble Space Telescope that was uh, launched with a shuttle and then was maintained and uh, six times with humans, but uh, that was in the relatively low Earth orbit, uh, like at uh, uh, what's uh, uh, about uh, 800 kilometers. So we had a special mission to go there. But in the case of the James Webb Space Telescope, it's so far, so it's really not uh, at the moment accessible. It has not been designed, in fact, uh, to be accessible uh, for humans. So it's all aut automatic. Although there are some rumors actually that NASA is planning to refuel fuel it by a robotic mission because the propellant on board that actually makes it like able to adjust it's like it's um it's what it's looking at is only going to last for around 10 years. So like there's some rumor that they actually plan to have like robotic refueling. So basically yeah, like a gas station well. attendant going to like the James Webb Space Telescope to fill it up again so that it can be operational for longer. But uh, now uh, if you talk about humans, you know there are destination, low Earth orbit, there are people talking about geostationary orbit for humans. But uh, also we made a study saying what could be destination for the future. And we looked in particular at the L2 point where you could have this uh, uh, space station or space observatory. So possibly the future one uh, will, will have a possibility to have access from humans. Okay, and then we also have the second question. I can read it again. So um, it was about data. So how about data access for the internet, the different instruments? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so there is a, it's a, it's a joint collaboration between uh, NASA, ESA, and also the Canadian Space Agency. And they follow a general route where those that have uh, built uh, instruments, they have access uh, already to planning some observations. So also, Claude, uh, some, there are some, uh, time for the first uh, use of the uh, the GWST that is shared between some of this community, but there have been also open call for the community, and then people can propose uh, uh, to observe some target and some uh, science, and they have a, uh, then they have a pointing to observe those target, which is uh, 
operated and then they will have access to this data for some time period, but uh, uh, very soon after, in less than a year, all these data are made available to the community at large with archive and uh, the whole world is uh, welcome to, to use this data. Great. So I think we can start with Leander's uh, talk. Oh, you, wonderful. Yeah. yeah, I hope you can all hear me now. well. We can so see. You can see and, and we can hear. Ah, wonderful, yeah. yeah. So I will talk about characterizing exoplanet atmospheres with the James Webb Space Telescope. Um, and first I will start by a short comparison of the James Webb Space Telescope at Hubble, which um, you can see, which was used before to characterize exoplanet atmospheres together with also Spitzer and ground-based tel telescopes. And you can here, see here with a diameter of about 6.5 meters, it's much larger and also looks more into the mid-infrared and near-infrared, or sorry, um, wavelengths and has also much larger focal length. And so um, up until now, um, here you can see an, a catalog by exoatmospheres by the Institute of Astrophysically, the, uh, the um, Canaria. Um, and you can see that mostly Jupiters and warm Neptunes and also warm super Neptunes, so very large planets, the atmospheres have actually been characterized and very few molecules have been detected or have been identified there yet, such as water, CO, helium, um, and also sometimes natrium, kalium, and so on. Um, um, and especially for like smaller um, Earth size and warm uh, planets like the Trappist systems, only very featureless spectra and helium have been found yet, as you can see here in this graphic. Um, so, and uh, also, James Webb Space Telescope is not designed to Im imagine. Uh, to image Earth-sized exoplanets and get their reflected spectra, which would be ideal, but one has to think, uh, imagine that James Webb was designed actually in the 1990s, so that is a thing for future space telescope, but it also still has the ability to uh, characterize mostly larger planet, uh, mostly the atmospheres of larger planets due to transit spectroscopy, which you can see here in this video. Uh, so in the, you can measure more or less the transit of an exoplanet in front of the star. And then in different wavelengths, there is, uh, you can see the transit curve, which is deeper or less deep in different atmospheres and in, uh, in different um, wavelengths and there this absorption can be used to characterize the planet's atmosphere as well and you can imagine this is much easier for large planets or like jupiter um, jupiters which or orbit the star more uh, quite near it's the most easiest thing or not easy but it's uh, the easiest, or uh, you get the best um, spectra. Um, but um, one for smaller stars, such as Andros, still when a terrestrial planet orbits nearer to the star, the ratio of the two uh, of the star and the planet surface is it's much nearer, and therefore also the ability to de detect the transit is much higher. Uh, so here you can see for, for Sun, an Earth-like planet, or Earth transits at about uh, an orbital period of 365 days and has a very low transit probability because of this long time of one transit. And therefore, also the transit depth is, is, is much smaller for an Earth-like planet or for Earth around Sun, but if the star gets smaller, the 
an Earth-like planet in the habitable zone also goes near to the uh, to the host star, and therefore the transit probability and also transit death gets much higher, especially for n dwarfs, for typical n dwarfs, which has, have about twenty five percent of the solar mass. You can see here. Androids have about eight to sixty percent of the solar mass, and luckily for us, most of stars in the solar neighborhood, so about two thirds of them, are expected to be androids, which makes it possible to maybe characterize also atmospheres of terrestrial or Earth-like planets with WST. Uh, one of the most exciting targets is actually the TRAPPIST-1 system, which is about 39 light years away, so quite here, uh, quite near, and which consists of is a very complex system around the uh, 0 0.09 solar mass M dwarf um, of seven stars, where three of them, so TRAPPIST-1 E, F, and G, are expected to be in the habitable zone, which is the distance of a star. Uh, where liquid water could be theoretically possible on the surface of the planet. And therefore, uh, in, there have been many um, studies as well to look how the, uh, to, to more or less simulate what James Webb Space Telescope would see from uh, the uh, TRAPPIST-1 for different plants around the TRAPPIST system in this distance. Um, and therefore, um, here for TRAPPIST-1E, when uh, there was a study by Christensen Button in 2018, uh, where they assumed an Archean Earth-like composition of the atmosphere of TRAPPIST-1E, which is a very early Earth atmosphere, which is mostly of molecular nitrogen um, and also 5% CO2, 0.5% uh, methane, then also no CO and also 1% uh, water. And they assumed that was very temperatures of about 2,200 Kelvin. Then they used this forward model or the radiative transfer code with Nemesis, which is the nonlinear optimal estimator for multivariate spectral analysis uh, to simulate what this spectra of, or what the ideal, ideal spectra of this planet would look like. Uh, then you have a lot of instrument noise by JWST, which you can also take into account um, with this tool, which is Pand Expo by Batala et al., um, where you can see here the noise, and then you can solve more or less this whole problem inversely and look what you could detect here um, from this spectra, which you would expect to observe with JWST. And they found for uh, this Earth like uh, Earth sized planet, or more or less Earth sized terrestrial planet, uh, they can constrain biogenic uh, CH4, which is expected to uh, be by, by, uh, by metanogenesis, a uh, biological process in maybe the atmosphere, but they can't um, detect ozone, which is also a quite for a modern Earth, so with a little bit different composition. So shortly as a summary, so the James Webb Space Telescope is expected to characterize dozens of mostly giant planets over the mission lifetime, and also it will try to observe uh, the atmospheres of temperate terrestrial atmospheres, which but will maybe require many observation days, so about 30 uh, to even 100 so it won't be the um, most efficient mission for that. There's the war, which will be the next next big NASA mission, which hope, but it will be very impressive. And also, lastly, there have been studies that showed that maybe some biosignatures could be detected or could possibly be detectable with the James Webb Space Telescope. So thank you very much for your attention. Yeah. Thank you, Leander, for your presentation. So um, I would say, uh, first of all, uh, Adriano Utino has just uh, posted in the, in the chat the link to follow tomorrow live event. So um, if you need it, it's there. 
And so uh, with a look to tomorrow, I will ask to Rock Kitty now if he can tell us a bit about any updates that we have for the launch. Is there any? Yeah, there are, there are a couple of updates. So, okay, let me see. So the rocket Ariane 5 rolled out from the vehicle assembly building yesterday, last uh, night, actually. It made uh, its final wave about 2.7 kilometers from the vehicle assembly building to the launch pad. Here, I don't know if you can see the image, hopefully you can. Uh, here's the vehicle already on the pad, waiting for the liftoff. The teams are tracking down. There was a slight issue with the data telemetry, the data connectors between the launch pad and the rocket, but that's not an issue for the launch because those uh, data links are ba basically disconnected at the liftoff and don't interfere with the whole launch sequence. So both NASA and ESA are currently go ahead for the launch. The latest weather forecast still shows around 80% of the favorable weather during the launch video. So it should launch tomorrow. That's great. Thank you. And OK, so if there are any questions, let me check the chat. But I don't feel like there are now. Maybe we can uh, now give a bit of um, uh, overview on the technical issues. So I can maybe share my screen and we can rewatch to get some images. So just a second, please. OK. Can everybody see my screen? Yeah. OK. So uh, Rocca, the floor is yours. Just tell me <laughs> what, uh, what you want me to move on, if there are any issues you want to maybe deepen or to focus on for, for the technical uh, aspect. Not really. We can maybe show the image with the rocket configuration so the people yeah. can actually imagine how everything is uh, okay. basically. Sorry. No, no problem. Ooh. We have uh, this, uh, this is for later. <laughs> Let's not spoil it. <laughs> yeah. Just a second. OK, so uh, you were asking me about? Uh, there is a white image with the rocket uh, configuration. Yes, yes. Uh, so people can see how actually everything is done. There it is. But in the meantime, I have here the model of the oh, Ariane okay, 5. Okay. So, oh, okay. <laughs> so you can see, so there is a core stage. We call it a core stage. It's uh, propelled by liquid oxygen and water uh, with the Vulcan 2 engine on the bottom. Then on the side, there are two side boosters, solid rocket boosters. Uh, they provide about 90% of the thrust during the first phase of, of the flight for basically approximately one, two and a half minutes. And then after eight minutes, the uh, core stage separates from the second stage. And you have here small second stage. Uh, Ariane 5 on this launch will fly in the ESA variant. So uh, there is a small engine that can ignite only a single time. So it's going to be a single burn. And after 25, seven, uh, 25 minutes, the engine will shut down and uh, Satellite, this the James Webb, which is encapsulated inside the pharynx. So this is this structure at the top, will then separate from the rocket. Pharynx are separated when the uh, rocket actually leaves the atmosphere because they are dead weight, even though they weight only like one and a half ton. They are still <laughs> quite heavy. But yeah, every kilogram counts on this launch because we are sending the James Webb on the Earth escape orbit. And uh, the total mass of the James Webb telescope when it was last weight was approximately six and a half tons, 300 kilograms of that was a propellant. That's sufficient for approximately 10 years of, of operation. Uh, so the whole space telescope then uh, weights about 6.3 tons. And the payload capacity for the Ariane 5 on this orbit is around seven tons. So it's gonna be a tight squeeze. There is not much room to maneuver. <laughs> Okay, in the meantime, I could find the image you were asking me. So here it is. So yeah, okay. here you can see just how tight the squeeze, so how much they actually had to fold the James Webb to fit it inside the fairings. 
At the top, yeah, you can see the giant swap. This is green, uh, yellow, and the blue uh, craft. Then we're having two uh, payload uh, fairings. And underneath them, the uh, black structure is a payload adapter. That's actually the interface between the rocket and the satellite. There is also where the power or the thermal links, power links, data links are uh, connected between the spacecraft and the rocket itself. Underneath that, we have an avionic module, the second stage, and then the core stage in the middle at the bottom and two solid rocket boosters on the sides. Thank you. OK. So um, I would say that uh, I have a, questions for, a question for our speakers. So I was willing to know what you are personally most looking forward to seeing with the web telescope, because we have said that it's going to be uh, something that will show us something we have never seen before. So I was curious to know what you would like to, to see with what you expect from, from this technology. May I? Yeah. I make a couple of considerations because, um, okay, you know, the space renaissance is not only for science and technologies, uh, but we are, all, we are also a philosophical association. Therefore, uh, seeing uh, such a big event like the launch of uh, this new space telescope, uh, uh, of course, uh, some considerations are raising, raising to, to my mind. And uh, uh, the first one was the, that I was impressed by the fact that uh, the, the mirror is uh, uh, covered by gold. Okay, so I just uh, would like to share now a a small uh, uh, one only slide with you that represent the Psyche asteroid. You know, the Psyche asteroid is a, a, an incredible value by uh, precious minerals, including gold, titanium, and uh, platinum, and a lot of things that they estimated the value of 10 quintillions. Quintillion, a quintillion, I, I don't know how much it is. However, it is, it is uh, some millions of billions, something like that. And somebody said that taking this asteroid to Earth would make all the terrestrials billionaires. But I am, uh, we were reflecting uh, in, in some discussion in the past days, uh, would it be that the, uh, the goal of uh, mining uh, the precious uh, asteroids. I think mining the, uh, the precious asteroids would be very much more worth if that value will be used in space to build the space infrastructure to allow humanity to expand. That would be uh, uh, not, 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 not considering that if we take that thing to Earth, the Earth economy will be completely uh, uh, jeopardize it because the value of gold and other things will fall and because, uh, because it will uh, be a big inflection and uh, and uh, we will we would repeat uh, the colonial colonialist uh, style that we made when we colonized America and we 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 stole the gold of Incas and brought back to Europe to, uh, so uh, we have another idea of a settlement in space, another idea of uh, uh, co colonizing that we, we also don't like to use this word colonizing. However, the point is that we should be able to go into space and use the space resources for space development. So to, to allow humanity to to work and live in space. So th th that is particularly symbolic that we see the new uh, telescope uh, uh, plat um, uh, covered by, by gold, I think. And, and, and yeah. also, yeah, yeah. the right. second consideration, very quick, because I see that Bernard likes to say something also, uh, that the more we study the universe, the more we understand that the universe is a, a unique, uh, big, uh, 
ecological environment. We are immersed in a cosmic uh, ecology. So uh, what we call the planet is not something different from the rest of the universe. Our planet, our mother planet is in space, is not somewhere else. So the, 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 it was cross-fertilized by comets, asteroids, and it, it continues to be cross-fertilized. And the solar system will be cross-fertilized by our expansion. We are also a form of life, and we are, uh, of course, contaminating other environments. This, that is life. Life is change and cross-fertilization everywhere. So these are these are two small thoughts that came to my mind, seeing <laughs> the, the the beauty of, of this uh, of this uh, event. Okay, so yes, I I have also some uh, some comment. Okay, on, on the lines of uh, okay, what is the value per kilogram? So you know, gold is fifty thousand uh, uh, dollars per kilogram. But there are resources even much more precious than gold when you go to space. For instance, um, you know, we launched a, a James GWST, so $10 billion. So it's $1 million per kilogram of the telescope uh, we have to pay. So, and why, why is that so expensive? Because of these high technologies and, and high value that you have. And I say that this is in order to capture things from space that have even much more values on gold. And for instance, uh, per weight, uh, the, the photon information from photons that we get, you know, photon has no weight. So that is the infinite value if you can capture some of these photons that are going to tell us about uh, the first uh, stars, about the origin of uh, planetary systems, about uh, possible uh, atmosphere composition of uh, uh, other planets, maybe even science of uh, uh, life there. And I would say that, uh, yes, we have to harvest this uh, resource that uh, is going to uh, inspire curiosity in everybody to know about our origins. And I hope also even to uh, harvest the, one of the biggest resources that we have, to inspire, train, educate creative minds on Earth. Creative uh, people, young kids and also older kids like us <laughs> uh, to inspire them to say, yes, we, we want to know more about our universe, our origin, and we can also develop some very smart technology to do that in the greater Earth. And that's also what I like in the James Webb Space Telescope. It's now also uh, quite far from Earth, 1.5 million uh, kilometers it will be, and uh, it's under the influence of the Sun and Earth and uh, we have all these uh, territories, these islands in space. Uh, we'll have the moon, the first uh, island we'll go. Uh, we have uh, also the, the deep space, Lagosian Pond, then we have asteroid and Mars. So that's uh, all our steps into the greater Earth to do also great science, uh, show technologies, inspire the people for our future. So that's how I see it uh, uh, as a James Webb. Uh, it could have been done uh, also in a faster way and uh, okay, at a lower budget, but okay, now that it is there and uh, we are really very excited to see what we can harvest like we have done with a uh, Hubble Space Telescope. I also want to say something about sensitivity of the instrument and what we can expect, what kind of observations we can expect. So actually um, the James Webb Space Telescope is an infrared space telescope. So basically like for the viewers, you have like, you have your, um, the, like the electromagnetic spectrum. You have basically, you imagine a rainbow, um, red is like a long wavelength. And actually below and beyond that, you also have infrared, which is like something that you can't see. But it's basically like a very, very deep, deep red shade of red that has even longer wavelength. And so James Webb will actually be able to capture photons of that very, very like far red wavelength. But actually like, um, it will look at very, very dim objects. So basically James Webb will expect to like maybe observe one photon per second, which is like a very, very, very dim source. So this is kind of like comparable, like imagine if you have like a children's nightlight and you put it on the moon, and then you look at it from Earth to the towards this very, very dim source on the moon. And actually, James Webb will be able to observe objects even like 1 20th of that. So like extremely, extremely kind of like dim objects, very, very far away. So we will actually see things we don't really even know what we're going to be able to see because we've never actually had the capabilities to observe objects so dim. So there will be, of course, some object that we already know about. 
that we already know about that exists, that we're obsessed with Hubble and other telescopes, but also some new objects that we were never able to see before because they are so, 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 so very old, so very dim and so far away. And so there were probably a lot of things that we don't even know what to expect. Like, of course, like many of the astrophysicists, they already know, okay, we want to have a look at the black holes. We want to have a look at the very early universe. We want to have a look at very, very dim stars and galaxies. But then there might also be something out there that we didn't actually know about that it exists because we never had the possibility to actually to actually observe it. And this is like what I'm looking most like forward to, you know, the surprises of what we're going to find out there. It will be like changing our glasses, the glasses we use to see the universe. <laughs> That's very exciting, really. Okay, so um, if there are no more questions in the chat. I can comment um, on the price of the, yeah? of the telescope, what was said earlier about the gold. So yeah, the Vyas Web uh, is really sets a, a new record, not only in the instruments and observation that it will be doing, but also in the time over runs 14 years to a bit late uh, and with a price stack of 10 billion dollars and rising right now yeah if if the, actually the engineers decided to rather build the telescope out of the pure gold they could actually build by volume of course because with the weight it would be even more uh, they, they would be ab ab actually able to build not only the flight article but also the test article and the article for the smithsonian museum all within the budget that james webb is currently under, <laughs> but yeah, for me, it's from the engineering uh, uh, point of view. Yeah, I'm just ho ho would like to see uh, the uh, the web to go through the deployment sequence successfully, so, so the all systems and instruments are bri brought into operational phase uh, without m many problems, and the scientists can start using it. And hopefully we can hope for some new images similar to the, let's say, Hubble Deep View, view or Pillars of Creation that actually inspire all of us. Mm -hmm. Also, one more comment on the gold. Of course, it's a good scientific reason and like reason why it's coated with gold. So actually, like when mirrors are not made of steel because it would be too heavy, they're made of beryllium, which is much, much lighter and also very durable. And then they're coated with gold because beryllium itself is not very reflective. And gold is actually very, very good um, reflective in the infrared. So it has like this gold shimmer because it's not so, so good reflective in the visible one. But infrared, it's very, very good reflectance. And of course, that's the reason why it is coated with gold. But of course, it also looks very pretty. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, does anybody want to add something or are we fine with it? I think it was a very interesting discussion and we had very nice presentations and I, I hope that our audience will look tomorrow. We'll follow the launch tomorrow with new eyes and much more informed thanks to our guests. <laughs> so thank you very much. And um, I think we could watch together um, the video yeah. that is about the web telescope. Yeah, so that but we can... uh, before that, we wanted also to, to talk about uh, the future for uh, your yeah. mama. Oh, yeah, right. and, and with, uh, we end with the closure. So clearly, uh, it was uh, very uh, nice to have this uh, gentleman in space renaissance. And uh, then we are going to celebrate tomorrow lunch and uh, uh, Christmas with family and all the, uh, all the good uh, opportunities uh, uh, all over the globe uh, towards the end of the year, New Year. But uh, next year is uh, also quite uh, uh, amazing for us. Huh? So we um, we have, for instance, from the uh, Space Renaissance International, we have a series of uh, webinars, huh? the first and the, the third Monday of uh, each month. So already 3rd of January, we'll have a very nice talk about space tourism uh, uh, there, and then we'll have a whole series. Uh, then uh, from uh, the, uh, okay, the, Art Moon Mars uh, platform. We have one of our baby project, the Moon Gallery uh, project that is going to launch uh, this version to the ISS in February. At the end of February, uh, to be of March, 20 February, 8th of March, we have uh, Summer Earth. Uh, so we'll have uh, first Anouk, uh, Leander, and me. We are going to, uh, with a team of uh, uh, eight, 10 people from Europe, going to join some colleagues in Chile for a campaign. And so, yes. So in university of, uh, uh, we're together with the University of uh, Atacama. And so we go to the uh, high altitude Atacama in various places to go close to the highest active volcano in the world, Ojos del, Sol del Salado, 
to uh, measure some glacier, to measure some volcanic activities, and also areas which looks uh, like Mars. And so uh, Anouk and Aleanda will be our astrobiologist uh, for this uh, campaign. And they, uh, they just had a review uh, yesterday. <laughs> so we are, uh, uh, so readiness, acceptance, uh, review. So we're preparing very nice protocol with our collaborators from uh, Atacama uh, University. And then uh, we have uh, also very, okay, so the launch of the Moon uh, Gallery. So that will be launched on the 19th February from Wallops Island. Uh, so that's just a three hours drive from Washington, DC or from Baltimore. And uh, 12 February already, we organized a nice party in Amsterdam. Uh, so in the, and uh, so you are all invited uh, to celebrate that. And then we'll have uh, um, an event in Baltimore Institute of Arts on the 18th of February and 19th February, we'll have the launch. So some of us will look at it. But uh, I think, uh, I hope that uh, also with our, uh, the Euro Moon Mars, uh, yes, communication team, we are going to the Serena. We'll have another TV uh, event also with Space Renaissance uh, to follow that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So then in April, of course, we have the European Geoscience uh, Union, uh, uh, Vienna, where a uh, number of, uh, of our um, abstract have been proposed. We are organizing sessions there. There is the biggest event for geoscientists. But we'll have some um, events about uh, lunar science exploration, Mars science exploration, analogs. Uh, uh, and uh, instruments, so where uh, we have already some uh, some abstract. Uh, the deadline for abstract will be 12 of January, so you still have the chance to contribute to this event in uh, Vienna, and we'll also gather with some of the Moon Mars team. Uh, about Vienna, again, end of May, we'll have an event in uh, Vienna, together with the European Space Policy uh, Institute, uh, so-called Galaxy Forum, and we will have something in collaboration with Space Renaissance and with the Moon Mars uh, to, to gather there, so we, we, we see some of you. Then, uh, okay, April as well, we uh, are going to resume uh, our uh, uh, so analog uh, campaign. So now let's, uh, we have some real astronauts uh, from uh, Empol with us, uh, Serena and Leander. So can you describe uh, what sure. you're Yes, yeah, so the ample campaigns, uh, now we are at number 10 and 11, that's our plan for April 2022. Uh, Leander and I personally took part to ample 8, so just a few missions ago. So basically these are um, campaigns that are organized together with the Analog Astronaut Training Center and the Euromoon Mars. And they are held in uh, Poland. Uh, in Kolostracetki, <laughs> sorry for the pronunciation, but that's kind of close to Krakow, let's say, that is a reference point for everybody. And the cool thing is that uh, they are open to students and researchers that are willing to experiment and test their projects and proposals in a real confined environment that simulates uh, a real spaceship. So it was very interesting also from my personal point of view, I was there to test part of my thesis project in industrial in uh, product design. And Leander was there also to perform some, some of his experiments. And it's really something we're really inspiring and uh, uncommon to experience. So maybe Leander, you want to add something about this? Yeah, it's really a wonderful experience to be in this isolated environment for one week with a crew of um, of four to six uh, of five to six people so it's really interesting to see the interaction between the crew and also the psychological implications as well as also some astrobiology experiments which will are simulated to be performed also in habitats on the moon or on the mass yeah Yes, the topics are, are really varied. So I was a student in design. Uh, Leander was from astrobiology, but then we had also some engineers with us. And it's really a very nice laboratory space where, where students and researchers can experiment in different fields. It's really very interesting. Then we also have something more from the communication side. We, we have a collab with platform, yes? Yeah. So. Uh... Yeah, so we have uh, put together uh, uh, in collaboration with CollabWiz as a platform to help in collaboration, also in uh, working together, uh, also in uh, 
developing some business and entrepreneurship uh, aspect. So we are uh, preparing uh, some uh, proposals for activities, for funding as well, uh, all over. Uh, I have to say also, uh, we have uh, developed uh, some uh, uh, system of funds or grants for young professionals. So we have that traditionally, and we have the Young Lunar Explorers uh, grant uh, from the Edwigs that we give uh, to young professionals helping us or uh, uh, in, uh, in various uh, activities, uh, be there uh, research, instrumentation, uh, campaign, uh, communications, uh, and, and so on. Uh, I have to advertise also that actually the Space Renaissance National has also uh, uh, a program so called Medici funds, mentorship programs that you are all welcome to talk to Adriano uh, on this. So we are really trying to develop a community. We are also uh, now even developing uh, a Moon Mars uh, Foundation to try to get, to get uh, some funding uh, for uh, our activities. So next year, we have also some very interesting, uh, uh, oh yeah, so we have, uh, yes, uh, you see, uh, quite a uh, uh, busy. <laughs> uh, busy program. So this is on uh, our website uh, now. Uh, we have talked at some um, of the event, but in particular, we will have a, a workshop, uh, so-called Galix uh, Space Renaissance Young Moon Mars uh, workshop in uh, March that will be virtual, but maybe with some also physical uh, component in Hawaii and uh, in, uh, in uh, Europe. We have some very interesting event at the end of March. Uh, so uh, at the International Social Federation uh, committees, uh, also we are going to, do, uh, to talk with some of the space committee uh, experts. We have some um, events uh, as well. Oh yes, end of April, we are planning an event in uh, La Palma where we will have some uh, contribution to the Astro Brasil conference. Uh, also, we have uh, one astronomer there, <laughs> Rosa, that is uh, now uh, staying one year in, uh, in La Palma trying to observe with our telescope, uh, but uh, she has a lot of volcanic uh, uh, issues there. And uh, we have uh, now in collaboration uh, with uh, Space Renaissance uh, International, we will have a space festival in uh, Berlin. Uh, so Adriano, you want to describe a, a bit the status of this? this will be organized by Space Renaissance, but this contribution from Young Moon Mars in uh, Berlin on, uh, from the, uh, uh, in the beginning of July. Um, yes, thank you. Um, this event will be very important. I think that the, uh, the main event uh, of a Space Renaissance in 2022, it will be uh, three days, uh, as we know now, because we are at the beginning of the organization. It will be in the in the premise of an important observatory in uh, in uh, in Berlin, and uh, uh, yeah, it will be three days: uh, one day for science, one day for art and philosophy, one day for uh, technologies, in, innovation, habitats, uh, astronaut expansion, etc. Uh, so uh, the uh, organizer is uh, Sabine Heinz. Uh, she's not with us today um, uh, for, for, for other, other duties. However, uh, I think we will know uh, more things about this uh, big event in, in the next days and, and weeks. And another important thing that I don't see in, the cal in your calendar is uh, the September. Padova. Uh, you were going to talk about that. Yes. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so we have uh, also uh, an event that we planned initially in May that will now has been confirmed for 7 to 9 September in Padova, where we will on one hand celebrate Padova 800 years, Federal University's 800 years anniversary. And so there will be contribution from uh, uh, Moon Mars, but also Space Renaissance to this event, also in a format where we'll have science, tech, innovation one day, uh, habitat and astronauts and human and human uh, factors and medicine second day and one uh, day about uh, humanities art and society and so it would be uh, uh, I think also a great uh, place Padova you know so close to Venice but very interesting in itself so a good uh, gathering seven to nine September and also September we have uh, the International Astronomical Congress. Uh, in Paris from 18 to 22nd of September, also some event like uh, UN, IAF uh, workshop, uh, Space Generation Congress. And so that's an event where 
both the Earl Moon Mars are active in organizing session, also Space Renaissance, and uh, with some of the IF committee. So that would be great to have that in Paris. And to all our viewers of today that are interested uh, in space, you are all welcome uh, to approach us to, to participate to some of these events for next year. Good? Excellent. Yes, so lots of initiative going on. <laughs> no, I wanted, just wanted to say that it's very, very uh, fine and uh, well, a good thing that uh, Euromoon Mars and Space Renaissance are starting to work together in a closer way. And we hope we will have all of you as members of Space yes. Renaissance as soon as possible. And uh, okay, so uh, yes, please. Uh, there is a, a form that one can subscribe as a member. Yeah, so just Google Space Renaissance and you see just uh, see this form as uh, it's like what uh, 24 euro for uh, senior and 12 euro for uh, students or something like that. Uh, yes, and you register and you get access to all our network and uh, uh, so opportunities. And so we we will all are going also to have some program uh, jointly with uh, between your own Mars and uh, Space Renaissance. And thanks very much, uh, Adriano and Space Renaissance uh, for organizing also this, uh, this uh, forum and this uh, 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 YouTube uh, cast. That's something I say we, we would want to do in the future. Yes, and also don't forget to uh, subscribe to the channel of Space Renaissance International. And yeah. also, if, if you like to follow uh, Euromoon Mars on Instagram, LinkedIn, we are everywhere. Uh, check our website. So just uh, keep updated because we will post soon our news. Okay, so um, I think we can go with the video maybe. Yes, so okay, so let's yes. launch. <laughs> let's launch uh, the video. <laughs> you see that? Oh, 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 okay. I, uh, sorry, not yet. Uh, sorry, not yet. Uh, sorry. Uh, wait. Okay. I have to launch it and share. So I. <coughs> ancestors who first speculated on the nature yeah. of those wandering lights in the night sky. We've crossed the solar system and sent ships to the stars. But we continue to search. We can't help it. A central element of the human future lies far beyond the Earth. Crave some cosmic purpose, then let us find ourselves a worthy goal. Okay, so that is the voice of Carl Sagan, huh? and so very inspiring, beautiful images. So thanks very much, uh, the, the, our panel from the today uh, launch, our moderator. Thank you very well. much. And uh, yes, yeah, so I think that's uh, also okay. Uh, uh, we have uh, also the tradition of a general uh, Euro Moon Mars uh, plenary meeting on the on the Friday, but we thought okay, this will be uh, the event uh, concluding uh, before uh, Christmas. So uh, we have uh, already discussed some of the plan for your own Mars space announce for next year. So that's also some of our goal. And uh, so, yes, so I, I want to ask uh, Serena to close uh, this event for all. Yes, thank you very much to our guests. Thank you very much to our audience for being with us. And I really wish everybody, and thank you Adriana Utino for hosting the, this event. That was great. And Merry Christmas to the everybody, to Space Renaissance International community and to the Euro Moon Mars community. Thank you very much. Good. See you Christmas next everyone. time. <laughs> and in good Bye. time. Huh? So I'll see you.
the rally during the good duration. And now the spacecraft would be already, uh, you know, uh, detached and uh, going to the 